POVO3, let's go and get started. <clears throat> um, AIs, uh, nothing going on there unless someone has something they want to mention. I do uh, want to talk about the SDK calls coming up, but I have that uh, as a future agenda item, so we can skip that for now. The first thing I want to discuss was actually <clears throat> upcoming phone calls. Um, here's the list of phone calls we have for the next so two months or so. Um, I, I crossed off, or I'm assuming people are going to want to cancel during KubeCon Seattle and Shanghai. Um, I was also assuming people might want to cancel during Thanksgiving and Christmas and New Year's. Um, that would give us, if we do that, one, two, three calls before KubeCon Seattle, and then resume back up on January 10th. What do people think about the schedule with respect to canceling calls? Due to holidays and vacations and stuff. Yeah, I think that makes sense. Okay. I mean, it's, it's the practical thing, right? It's, I mean, we, we, we're not going to go and set up a call on Thanksgiving and nobody's showing up. Right. I, I agree. Just why, I just don't want to make the executive decision without you guys checking or you guys yeah. verifying it. Uh, it's, just the end of the year. it's just the end of the year. That's what it looks like. Yeah. Now, the interesting thing is, we'll talk a little bit more about this later, is we talked about doing or trying to get out 0.2 uh, for Seattle, which basically leaves us three phone calls to resolve any 0 0.2 issues. So keep that in mind as we go forward. Okay. But um, before I ask the question, any objection then to this being our schedule for canceling calls? And if not, I'll make the I'll take the appropriate actions to get cancellation notices sent out and send out a note and stuff like that. But any objection to this schedule? No objection. All right. Cool. Thank you, guys. All right, community time. All right, is there anybody on the call um, new to the community who would like to bring up a topic that they would like to discuss? This is typically for time, a time for people who are, who are not normally part of the working group and there is not an agenda item for the topic they'd like to discuss. All right, cool, I'm not hearing any. We will keep moving forward then. Uh, hold on a minute. All right, um, moving forward. Okay, SDK work group. So Austin, you're on the call here, but let me just say what happened offline. Um, so I did hunt down Austin. Apparently he decided to take some vacation, shocking. Um, but uh, because of his work schedule, correct me wrong here, Austin, you, you wanted me to at least set up the meetings for the SDK calls going forward. And what I was thinking about doing was rather than setting up a doodle poll and wasting time going through that process, I looked at the last time we had a meeting, which was at Tuesdays at 1 p.m. Eastern. And I would, what I was gonna do was propose that we have weekly calls on Tuesdays at 1 p.m. at least until KubeCon North America to try to force some forward moving action here. Uh, what do you guys think? Uh, that sounds good to me. Sounds good to me, Doug. Okay, anybody else? Mark, you have an opinion? Because I know you're on there as well. I'm trying to remember who else was on the calls. Sorry, I got interrupted. All right, wait, what was the question? Tuesdays, 1 p.m. Eastern for SDK calls. Yeah, I, I think that should be fine. Okay. Any objection then to going forward with that? Okay, we'll do that. Thank you guys. So I'll send out meeting notices to the whole group instead of just myself and look for those. Um, so in terms of SDK work, um, honestly, I'm a little worried. I know that the Golang guys, or the Golang one, from VMware um, looks fairly complete. At least there's code out there. I haven't seen anybody asking for access to any of the repos. Um, so please be thinking about that because on next Tuesday's call, we really need to decide what we're gonna do there. Um, zero activity is not very good. Um, so think, be, be thinking about that because I know a lot of people did sign up. So it's a little distressing that no one is doing any work there. Um, hey Doug, on, on that note, this yeah. is Austin here. Um, our, our company has been doing a lot of work on this and we've baked it all into the next version of our serverless framework product. Um, and there's some great stuff that we've done and we've definitely invested a lot in this direction. We just have to put that into an SDK um, and put that in the, uh, and submit that to the, push that to the repo. Um, but just want to put that out there in case anyone else is working on any flavors, any JavaScript flavors of the SDK. Uh, but we've we've done some pretty good work here. We just got to put it into a, a cloud events SDK format um, and contribute it. So hopefully we'll get that done in, in a couple of weeks. Cool. 
Sounds good. So I, Austin, I, well, let me first state, I don't want to go too deep in, in terms of SDK since we have other meetings for this, but it would be great if we started to think about what are the feature sets uh, you, you know, at a high level that each of the SDKs is providing, you know, around versioning or, or uh, ways in which it deals with the data, data payloads, et cetera. Uh, we, we should understand what those feature sets look like so that we can rationalize what are the features of each of the SDKs independent uh, of the language. Yes, so we've already had a, a few SDK calls where we discussed the design goals of the SDK and aligned on which features we'd like in each individual version of the SDK. All that information is put in an SDK design doc, which I believe is in the is in this Google document somewhere. Um, but I, I, you know, as the SDK calls become a recurring thing, I you know recommend at least using that as a starting point because we established some pretty good alignment there, and I think that the Go version was actually uh, following that. Um, now, of course, our, you know, on, on our side, we've been trying to follow that as well, while also trying to focus on features that help meet our company's uh, priorities at the same yep. time. And I think that's kind of where we left off on those SDK calls. It was, hey, look, we have a loose alignment on the things that we want to focus on. We agree that there's still some outstanding issues here. Um, and if anyone wants to jump ahead and focus on anything else, then just kind of go for it and let's get some implementations on the table and see where we end up. Great. Thanks. Okay. Anything else related to the SDK work people want to bring up? Um, there is a gentleman uh, who I haven't been able to get back to. I'm not sure if he's on this call. Uh, I think it's uh, Matthias from, from Red Hat. Is, is he on this call? I know that his team has done some work on the on the Java SDK. Yeah, I don't see them, or I'm sorry, I don't see him on the call. Okay, um, Doug, if you, once you schedule this, uh, if you can make sure to ping him. Yep. And uh, let him know that the SDK calls are, recurring SDK calls are, are happening and uh, he or his team should join. Okay, cool. Just yeah, myself. Since, since I nominated our, us for the, the C Sharp for, uh, flavor of this, I had a conversation with our engineering team um, last week when I was in Redmond. And uh, it's just for us, just a schedule alignment thing, uh, not willingness to do the work. So I'm going to try to you know, make that happen within a relatively short time. Cool. Sounds good. Thank you. Oh. Excellent. Cool. Thank you, guys. All right. Moving forward then. Um, Kathy, I don't see okay i don't see kathy on the call but i don't think anything's happened with the workflow subgroup so i don't think there's anything to update there um kubecon sessions so I, actually i think i could probably delete this link the slides are out there clemens kathy and myself have been working on it um the slide link right here please take a look at you if you're interested there's a intro and a deep dive session we'll be presenting at if you have any feedback commentary on the slides please let us know relatively soon I believe officially we're supposed to submit the charts by tomorrow. Um, that date is uh, is kind of important for the Shanghai one in particular because they're gonna be doing translation on the slides in advance into Chinese. So if we miss that date by day or two, it may not be a big deal, but we definitely can't wait until like the day of, like we can for normal conferences. Um, so please uh, review that when you get a chance if you're interested in providing feedback. And actually, I'm sorry, go ahead, comments. Yeah, the deep the deep dive section I made a little bit wordier than I usually make a slide for for that purpose, so that the uh, the folks uh, who are doing the Chinese translation have a bit more meat to look at. Yep, that's good. Yeah, I, I wasn't sure whether they were going to translate speaker notes or not, so I figure it's probably safest to just stick it inside the slides like you did. So that's good. Yeah. Um, now, uh, since Kathy isn't on the call. Um, and Clemens, you're technically going to be on vacation. We're supposed to have a phone call right after this one to continue discussions about it. Um, but Clemens, I assume you're not going to make it. If Kathy does not join, um, then there will be no phone call uh, for anybody else that was thinking about joining that call. So it all depends on whether Kathy makes it or not. Yeah. So just give you guys a heads up. All right, um, KubeCon Seattle. Um, I have a feeling most of us are probably going to be really, really busy, but I thought I'd ask the question anyway. Do we want to try to have a formal working group meeting during KubeCon Seattle? We will have an intro and a deep dive session there, but do you guys want to have a real working group meeting? Anybody have any desire to try to set one up? 
Okay, I'm not hearing any. I, I don't think we have any really large issues to discuss, so I don't think it warrants a face-to-face -face for that purpose. Um, but not hearing anybody really jumping up and down for it, I'm gonna assume that we'll, we will not have one. Is that okay with everybody? Works for me. Okay. I, I think having those other sessions uh, is, is good and can preclude the, the use of needing to have a formal working group meeting. Okay, sounds good. All right, moving forward then, uh, the interop work. So we did a meeting yesterday, and again, I apologize for it being on short notice, but um, between travels and stuff, I didn't get a chance to do another doodle poll. Uh, but we are going forward with the notion of a Mad Libs type of scenario. And if you scroll down in the document that's linked in the agenda, you'll see under demo flow, the exact flow it's gonna, that it's gonna take. Uh, basically a sentence is gonna be picked at random with some missing words like nouns, verbs, adverbs, send out an event to all the nodes saying basically what kind of words are missing. Those guys respond back with the words that they randomly chose. And then the, the, the controller, as I'm calling it, will sort of display the sentence with all the words filled in and hopefully it'll be funny. Um, from, a, uh, from a technical perspective, all we're really looking at is for the nodes or each company that wants to participate, all they really need to do is create a function that just picks a random word. Um, we do have a list of words available it's easily downloadable um, and it has, you know, nouns, adverbs, everything in there. So really all you guys need to do is generate a random number and index into the array for that type of word. It should be really, really easy for just about anybody to join and, and participate. Um, I do have an intern working on the actual UI piece of this itself. Um, I could show you guys that if you're interested. It's as of right now, it's, it, this is two or three, I think it's three. Um, it's something similar to this. We're not, he, he needs to work on it, um, but it's basically going to be a little bit graphical, things moving back and forth, so it's not as boring as just showing the sentences and stuff. Um, but that's the current thought process. More work needs to go on, the, needs to be done on the UI, but everything is dynamic, so people can easily join um, at the last minute. All we need is their icon to, to display their bubble or their circle. But that's the current plan going forward. If you have any suggestions or comments you want to do or you want to uh, make, just mention it on the Cloud Interop Slack, uh, Slack channel. That's where most of the discussions will be happening. Okay, any questions or comments on that? Um, we were, originally we were talking about doing this in time for KubeCon Seattle, but given the, how easy or lightweight it should be for people to create a function to just basically generate a random number, it would be really nice if we could actually get this going in time for Shanghai. I would love to demo this there as well. <clears throat> and in particular, it'd be really cool if people could support other transports besides HTTP or HTTPS. So Clemens, I'm kind of looking at you um, for AMQP. If, if you guys can support something else in time um, or support this in general, time for Shanghai and other transports, just let me know and we'll do our best to try to get this in there so we can demo it there. Um. Uh, I am going to, I'm going to review all the, the notes that were there for the interrupt uh, meeting um, tomorrow and then I'll see, but that should be possible because it's, um, I mean, it's not that hard. Yeah. As long as there's a go live client library for any transport we want to support, we should be able to add it to the, uh, to the guy that's sending out events. So that's, that's the only constraint that we have. Yeah, we have a, we have a uh, Go MQP library now. So that's uh, something that we can go and, and, and put together. Okay, cool. So just, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a personally fluent in it, so that it might look uh, a little out of place, but we'll see. <laughs> okay, yeah, that's fine. Um, yeah, so anybody else, if you have any other transports, um, you know, obviously one of the transports that we have documented for, that'd be, that'd be really handy. All right, any other questions or comments about the interrupt stuff? All right, cool, moving forward. So I sent out a note earlier in the week with a list of issues that I believe we can close. I put a comment in each one asking for someone to speak up if they thought I was mistaken and it should be kept open. I don't believe anybody's spoken up. Um, do people need more time to analyze these issues or could I ask for a bulk closure at this time? Itaú might want to discuss a little bit more about the correlation use cases. So the correlation use cases was basically just an issue that we opened up to sort of gather ideas about how people might want to do correlation. And that was it. I don't think this was necessarily meant to 
yeah. result in a change in the spec. It was more just to gather ideas. But if someone thinks I'm not remembering correctly, let me know. Sure. Um, Dickens, 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 no, okay. It's okay to close. Okay. Um, <clears throat> okay. Anybody else have any questions or comments on this? I, I, I definitely don't want to rush it, but at the same time, if no one thinks that they're worthy of keeping open, and we always can reopen them if we really want to. Um, but if you need more time or want more time to speak up, otherwise I'm, I'm going to ask if we can close them all. Okay, not hearing any objection. Is there any objection then to closing all of these PR or these issues? I think it's about 10 or so of them. Okay, cool. Thank you guys. I'll clean up our list greatly. All right, now on to PR review. So last week we resolved to adopt the direction of Clemens PR for restricting the character set. Um, since then, Clemens did a rebase and I don't think there's anything uh, semantically different about his original PR versus what's in there right now. But because the changes were made over the, over, within the last day or so, I did want to give people a chance just to do a quick review of it and raise any concerns uh, if they have um, just, just before I merged it. So has anybody taken a look at this and have any concerns about the merging? Just want to give people one last chance. Okay, in that case, let me formally ask the question. Is there any objection then to adopting this PR? All right, not hearing any. Cool, thank you guys. Thank All you. right, yep. Um, I don't believe Fabio is on the call, <clears throat> but this PR has been out there for a little bit. I think he made a very minor change just the other day, but I don't think it was really significant. Let me hide some of this stuff here. So, he made a minor change to our examples. Um, basically, what he wanted to do is to show real URIs in there, because I don't think our example is actually using a real URI. And then in the source, he actually put a real URI, because this is not a real one. It's a relative URI, which we technically don't support yet, which I actually think that's a mistake, but that's a different issue. Anyway, relatively small PR. Any comments or questions on this one? I agree with this. I the source as a relative URL confused me when I when we were implementing this. <laughs> yeah, it's good to get. I, mean, it, I figured this was actually kind of important, if nothing else, to make sure our examples are are correct and didn't mislead people. So, all right. Any then any objection to adopting this PR? Not approved. Yeah. Yep. All right. Cool. Thank you, guys. Next versioning scheme for our specs. This one's been out there for a little while. I think people wanted a little bit more time to think about it. Are there any new questions or comments about it? I don't think I've changed it for at least two weeks or so, I think. Well, looks good to me. Okay, All thank you, Roberto. Things together in one group. Yeah, basically everything except the primer will be lumped together on, with the same version number. Okay, any questions, comments from anybody else? Okay, any objection them to adopting this? Cool, you guys are really easy today. Yeah. All right, okay, this is, uh, zero two milestones. So what I did, let me close some of these windows here. Um, what I ended up doing was going through all open issues and pull requests or actually issues, I should say. All the pull requests are gonna get in whenever they get in. But for the issues, I went through and tried to take a guess as to whether I thought that they were um, significant design decisions that need to be made uh, for that particular issue or whether they're minor, minor type of uh, clarification kind of things. And so I went through all open issues and if I thought it needed to be I thought if it was a major design decision, um, then they would be a good candidate for 0 0.2 because our roadmap for 0 0.2 basically says all major design decisions except for security related ones. And this is basically the list that I came up with um, right here. So what I wanted to do was first ask if anybody had a chance to look through the issues themselves or to look at my analysis to see if they thought I either added something I shouldn't have or missed something along the way. Basically, does anybody want to make any changes to this list?
Okay, not hearing any. In that case, I'm gonna assume that this list is at least a good starting point. We can obviously change it as we keep moving forward over the next couple of weeks. Um, the, what I did is that before the call is I actually classified these or grouped them a little. The first two actually are PRs that are already out there, which have now basically both been approved, so we can skip those. Uh, these next three are kind of interesting. Clemens, these are, oh wait, is Clemens on the call? Yeah, you are, okay. So Clemens, these next three are about our data model. And in particular, they're very, very focused on the data attribute itself. I was wondering if you could take a look at these three in bulk when you get a chance, because I think that's kind of an important thing to get right, to make sure there isn't any confusion around what's allowable inside the data. Okay. Problem. Okay. Yeah, let me, let me take a look at this tomorrow then. Okay, cool, thank you very much. Yes, because I've been traveling and et cetera, so it was hard. Yep, not a problem, thank you. Now these the next ones, what I'm kind of looking for here is somebody willing to own it, not necessarily come up with a solution themselves, but sort of help drive the discussion to come to some kind of resolution, whether they come up with it themselves or not. Um, so let's walk through these one at a time. Jim, I believe you're on the call. This is one that you opened up. I was wondering if you'd be willing to drive this one forward, perhaps maybe generate a PR to force the discussion and just pick a direction based upon your preference or comments in there? Uh, sure, I can do that. I mean, I think one reason I didn't go down the PR road originally was this is really two PRs, yeah, one for each proposal. Um, so I, I was hoping to try and get, you know, the group to, to go one way or the other, and, and then I would do a PR to sort of... Uh, solidify that okay so that. so given how quickly we flew through the agenda and we have 35 minutes left let's let's do this um why don't you talk to the proposal very quickly and let's just see what the sense of the group is at least for the people on the call and that may give you a sense of which direction your pr should go sure okay so um uh, and my original uh, drive for this was a comment that i believe somebody from aws made quite a few calls ago um and that caused me to look at the current definition and we seem to um, just not be very consistent in the way that uh, some of the context items were named. So, um, you know, a more AWS-y style approach would be to sort of drop the word event from everything because we know we're talking about an event, we're actually in an event, so it's already contextualized. Um, alternatively, we should sort of, you know, prefix everything with the word event uh, and just follow some common theme. So th that was really my drive, you know, just to get a consistent um, feel. Um, the, the first one sits a bit better with me, um, but I, I've no real um, preference one way or the other. Okay. Anybody have any comments or thoughts on this one? Plus yeah, one on option one. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, thank you, Matt. Oh, actually, I was thinking option two. I prefer the one. <laughs> <laughs> Compacting events, I think, is, is the key. You know, it's already contextualized, as pointed out. Plus, when you're talking about consuming and storing millions of events per, per minute or even, you, you need to really condense. Yeah, I mean, there's, def there's definitely an, e an efficiency play somewhere, you know, if you're talking about JSON transport, certainly, or formats, yeah. What about just abbreviating to E? So E type, E source, E data. I'm plus one for option one. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> the, the version though, because we have a couple of versions here, right? We have the version of the actual event type and the version of the cloud event specification. So that's the one thing that's a little concerned about. Actually, believe it or not, I just realized this the other day, we actually dropped event type version. Yeah, we did. I we looked did. that up also, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Surprised me, but it's a good thing, yeah. <laughs> that, that's a good thing? Well, yeah, because you, we, I think we decided to encode the version into the event type string itself. Correct. Ah, okay. Yeah, we dropped that along the way a few months ago. Yeah. Yeah, I missed that one. Okay, do we have, do we have some examples in the repo of how the version is put into the event type string? I don't believe we have at this point in time, no. That might be a good thing to have. So, um, okay, so I'll raise my hand, speaking not as moderator of the group. Um, I definitely agree with everybody's idea that shorter is better and it, it, that these things are already contextualized. And from that perspective, I do like option one. However, 
What concerns me is that when we start talking about extensions, we ask people to give a, a descriptive name for their extension to avoid the, the risk of it being overlapping with something else going forward. And when I start thinking about some of our things or some of our properties like say ID, right? Or even version or type or whatever. Um, I think we should have, we should be forced to follow the same rule as extension authors. Cause I don't think we should necessarily treat ourselves as special. So when I see something like ID, it's like, well, what is it the ID of? And I, that's when I get a little worried, right? So for example, if someone else decides to add an extension with their own ID, they're going to call it foo ID or something like that, right? So what they're going to see are two things in the message, foo and, I'm sorry, foo ID and ID. That doesn't seem as descriptive to me and useful as event ID versus foo ID. And so from that perspective, I tend to prefer adding the word event in front of everything just so it's a little bit more descriptive. I could go technically either way, but I have a slight preference for adding the word event in front of everything. I just thought I'd put that out there. But anyway, anyway, anybody else have any comments? So, so my only other observation is um, recently we decided to adopt, did we all vote for lower, lower case only or lower yes. camel case? Yeah, we just approved that today, lowercase. Right. So, um, again, you know, this is a, a very personal thing. You know, so presumably, you know, this uh, event type would all be in lowercase. You know, so that's really what, we're, what the proposal would be in that situation. Right. Lowercase t on this one, yes. Uh, this is Vladimir. I have uh, one uh, comment regarding the naming. Um, in, in the past, I have uh, been forced to use a scheme that um, followed the pattern, like where we add event in front of everything. And sometimes uh, one emerges um, the definition from several things. So then becomes uh, a pattern A plus pattern B plus pattern C, and then the actual name of the thing. And it becomes very tedious to use. So I'm kind of in a favor of the short uh, uh, version, like type version, ID, and type. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, Anybody else? Sorry, Neil here. Um, sorry about late joining. I guess mm -hmm. the, it, it's a bit of a contextual argument because not to overload the context uh, too much, but if we are in the context of a cloud event, we know that it's type version, etc. If we're flattening, then we want to push that context down into the name of the field. Um, and then in other specs, you see that kind of reserved reserved fields sometimes start with an underscore or something like that to imply that they they have some kind of namespace separation. Um, I'm in favor of, of shortening, um, but at the same time, Doug, I can also see your argument. We should be, we should be following the standard that we're advocating as well. Yeah. So I'm in support of the, the first one. And as a spec, are the things called out explicitly in the spec not inherently special in some way? I'm sorry, you're cutting out a little there, Dan. Can you repeat that? Yeah, so as a spec, are we not, uh, the things explicitly called out in the spec, are those not inherently special in some way where they could avoid having the event? I'm in favor of the first one. Um, I acknowledge that, that that's not what we're asking other people developing extensions to do. Um, the underscore might be an option. Um, but I feel like what's called out in the spec is inherently special. Yeah. That is one way to look at it, yes. Okay, anybody else have any comments they want to bring up or opinion? I'm still in favor of the, the first one, the shorter. Uh, if I'm a developer looking, looking for the tool that I'm going to use, simplicity always appeals to me, you know, above all. And also I think is the emphasis should, could, I think should probably be on documentation. I'm just, you know, I don't think we need to establish in my opinion, I don't think we need strong patterns here or to kind of over-engineer some patterns to how we do the key names, as long as we have great documentation that just says exactly exactly which each one of these is. Um, except for the one, one thing I feel is if I'm a developer and I'm just stumbling across this, I just look at the word version, I'm going to think that that's the event type version. And not, uh, and not the cloud events version. So you, so you would want like a spec version or something like that, yeah? Spec version would, uh, naming such a difficult thing, but spec version would make it very clear to me that that's, 
that's something that's not the event type version. Okay. Plus one to everything was just said, and, and uh, thanks to, to, for the analysis as well. Yep. Okay. So, Jim, I think the discussion's died down there. It sounds like there, while there is a little bit of a split decision, there's definitely, I think, more people leaning towards number one. Um, it, it's kind of up to you and how you want to move forward. Um, you could choose to open two PRs so we can look at both options, or you could just choose one of the options and open a PR for that. It's kind of up to you. Um, I have a feeling that one PR with a choice might be better just from a process perspective, but it is completely up to you. From, from a personal workload perspective, I would prefer that option, yeah. <laughs> I, I'll, do, I'll, do, I'll do one PR for option one, and you know, if we decide to change direction, that's fine, I'll do it again. Yeah, does that sound okay with everybody from a directional perspective? Yeah, good. Sounds good. Okay, cool. So thank you, Jim. I, I have uh, one, other, one other comment on this. Um, mm -hmm. Well, it's actually on, on versioning. And I've been doing so much context switching and I'm in the car right now heading to a meeting. So I can't actually look at the spec. Uh, but when we settled on versioning on how to do event type versioning, um, do we settle on a, on a specific format? Are we forcing like um, a specific uh, versioning format there? Or are we letting, it, letting the user decide what that is? I believe it's producer defined. I, I believe it's I believe it's producer defined. The, the entire string is producer defined. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll throw out this suggestion. We may have discussed it in the past. I, I can't remember. Um, but is there a possibility that if we settled on like a strict way of versioning the event types, we could actually have a space in that version number for the cloud event specification? So, like, you know, like thinking of semantic version versioning or where there's just like three different spaces for versions, we could have the initial space always indicate the version of the cloud event spec. And then everything that, that perhaps follows that could be the version of the event type to consolidate these things into one single version. And it seems like the, the version of the event type as well as the cloud event specification version are, should be considered together. Uh, and along with the actual event type together, that's what, that's what the total schema actually looks like at the end of the day. So, so just throwing that out there, haven't haven't thought it through, but curious what you what you all think. Can I can I put a comment in? So did, that other version represents essentially the schema of the data payload. Is that is that the intention there? Correct. Uh, you know, in the in event driven design, you want to think about data evolution as you modify the actual event schema, and so having a clear place for. Um, for the version of the schema for the event that you're using is pretty important. So, but we have two versions, of course. We have the cloud event specification version, which is all about the metadata, and then we have the version of the, the actual event type schema. And I think these things perhaps could be designed with a, a clever single versioning implementation, but we'd have to get strict and kind of force people to use that, which might, might be good. Not sure. Any other comments on that? So, um, not Clemens, uh, Austin, would you be willing to write up a, a PR or issue to, to get your idea out there in, in a more formal form so people can review it? Yep, and I'll try and do it fast because I know this is kind of a, a bigger thing at the last minute when we're trying to stabilize this. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to comment, comment on that. that um, I think the reasoning for dropping the event type version was very solid a few months back talking about how, yes, event evolution or data evolution would be, is a big thing, but the only situation where you would actually change that version number is if you make breaking changes, and then you might as well change the event type anyway. And that was a very good point, in my opinion, for why the event type version is not needed. Well, it sounds like we, we uh, from what I gathered, it doesn't sound like we said it wasn't needed. It sounds like we're just, just going to add it into the event type string if, if people think they need that. Is that correct? Well, well yes. The point was that if, if you are making a breaking change, the, the event type version field doesn't serve any purpose because you might as well change the event type string. But I think that precludes making a complex versioning scheme that includes an event type version because it's 
already there. In the discussion, there was also a feeling that there is a redundancy with the schema URL. Yeah, and not only that, I think I think we also looked at the schema URL. <clears throat> excuse me, as an example of why you could put it both into one, because many times the schema URL expresses not just the type of data you're looking at, but the version of that type of data. It's, it's usually the version strings encoded in there as a date or something like that. So that they thought that was a good pattern to follow, I believe. Yeah, we we dug into this for a long time. How about I just put out a PR quickly? Yep. Um, and if it's interesting, we could discuss it, consider it. Uh, you know, if not, let's just let's just move forward and get this thing stable, so we can start building the, the ecosystem around it, which I think is the the ultimate bigger priority. Yep, that'd be great. Thank you. Yeah, I like looking at concrete things. Yeah, I agree. Also, and if Jim, I, I don't no pressure or anything, but the sooner we can get this done, because definitely changing attribute names at this point is a little disruptive. So the sooner we can get this over, it would be helpful. Understood. I agree with that 110 <laughs> percent. Totally aware of that. So I'll try and make this as you know as simple and straightforward as possible. We could discuss it for five minutes. If it's not like a, yes, we should do this. Let's just kill it. Move on. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Message received. Thank you. All right. Cool. All right, moving forward then, Klaus, immutability of event, what was it, event context. Did you want to quickly talk to this one? Well, <laughs> um, I think it was at, at KubeCon in, in Copenhagen that we had an idea of having multiple property bags, so one for um, annotations being added uh, while routing an event, and, and one for the well, initial extensions. So. That was just the, what we discussed uh, back in May. And so I was, when we were discussing now extensions being top level attributes, I was wondering what happens now to those um, annotations. So being added later on. So I was wondering if um, yeah, attributes can just be added by middleware just as normal attributes or if there will be some reserved uh, space or property back or how we handle this. Anybody have any opinion on this one before I give my opinion? <laughs> give your, yours first. Oh, sure. <laughs> okay. I, I tend to think of middleware as nothing more than um, another event source in, in a sense or an event producer. Um, so whether a piece of middleware adds another attribute, that's perfectly fine. It can add it, but we don't need to necessarily put them into special buckets. Um, they're just more additional properties, regardless of who added them. Because to me, the, the producer, I'm sorry, the receiver of this doesn't really matter or doesn't really care who added any particular property. All it cares about is what properties are there and what their values are. Where they came from is kind of irrelevant for the most part. Especially when you start talking about adding proxies in the middle, you know, are they allowed to add at the top level because that's what they're supposed to do is proxies or you know, are they middleware where no, you have to call out that they're special. It just seems like it's adding extra layers of complexity that things like HTTP don't have this problem with special buckets for proxies. So why should we? But that's my well, question. It, it has, it has, it has uh, rules about those things. Like what you can you do and what can you touch and what can't you touch? Um, so the question is what rules should, should apply here. So the, the, um, the, the place of, or, or the way how they're encoded is not as important as, um, you know, having some rules about what you can modify and what you can't. Like a proxy in, in HTTP can't just modify everything. There's rules written down in, in, um, in HTTP and what you can do. And there's also like, if you are um, acting as a proxy, there's stuff that you must do. Like you must add a via header, but you can't overwrite the via, via header. So that's stuff that's worth considering doing. Yeah, I, I kind of view those as as a secondary type of discussion, or as, as a different type of discussion than whether we should have bags yeah. for things. Yes. Yeah, I agree, and and I think ultimately we'll have to go and figure out what uh, um, you know, how we think about routing, um, and and whether we want to make routing a, a first level concept we want to go and tie into, but that's also a discussion to have with relationship to some context. I in the in the um, uh, Slack channel, I put something, a, a link in to a blog post that kind of discusses some of those things. Okay. Hi, this is uh, John. I think one of the angles that, that, I mean, I don't have a 
particular opinion about the bags or not, but the the angle we're talking about is is mutability and and there's issues around that in terms of security. Right, so I don't know, you know, how people are thinking around security issues, authentication, validation of the payloads, uh, yep. as well as tampering. That, that's right, and that, and I think that's that's actually where it really matters. Um, when you want to make sure that you got the message as it was as it was emitted by the sender, um, then you first need to have a rule about the immut immutability, means you can't touch this, and second you then need to have a way to ensure that, and that's by putting a signature somewhere. Yeah, we haven't really talked much about security and that kind of stuff yet. That's probably a discussion we need to have at some point. Yeah. To say whether we're, whether we're gonna even touch that topic. Yeah, I was curious about security when I was looking at the Kafka transport binding spec earlier, because when I mean, we see a lot of people asking about headers and passing security context. So it'd be good to to map that into the, the cloud event spec when we get up to it. Yeah. yeah, I think signing signature is the minimal thing we have we need to go and, and take a stance on. Yep. Um, it's not clear that we we um, need to go and invent, like, I, I think we should stay away from inventing something because that smells like W security and I don't want to go there. I think I mentioned that earlier. Um, but we need to take a stance on how we think about no, it cloud events relative to existing security mechanisms. Okay, anybody else have any comments on this one? Okay, so I'm not sure where this left us, Klaus. Um, <laughs> Me neither. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, okay, it, it sounds like there's almost two different discussions here. There's one about whether middleware should be forced or required to put properties into special locations or whether they can just put them in there just like any other attribute. And then there's a second discussion about do we need to find rules for uh, certain types of middleware, say like proxies and stuff like that. Um, and I'm wondering whether we could split the discussion into two. Because I think, I think, I didn't hear any necessarily disagreement about specifying rules for middleware or proxy middleware kind of things. But the specialized bucket thing, that, that seemed less clear to me. So um, I think there's maybe also a more formal aspect. So what exactly is an event ID identifying? So when I add or change something, when do I have to um, create a new event ID for this? I think we had this event ID discussion several times also over the past weeks. It's an interesting question. <laughs> so, um, so let me ask you this. How do you want to move forward on here? Would you like to leave the issue open for a while and try to solicit more feedback? Or would you like to force the discussion by putting some pull requests out there? Because that pull requests tend to force most discussions, right? Because it's actual proposal to change the spec. Um, but how, how would you like to come to a resolution on this? So I haven't made up my mind completely, so I would have a hard time putting together pull requests. I don't know what exactly to propose. Okay. Um, so then sounds like a little bit like you'd like to wait to get more feedback either from other people or until you've resolved the issue in your mind itself. So let me ask, let me change the question then. Do you think this has to be resolved in time for 0 0.2? Do you consider this to be a large design decision? Um, I don't know. Uh, so far, I haven't ran into any uh, implementation uh, question where I would have to add something uh, when routing an event. So maybe then I have a better opinion. So. Okay. So let me ask the broader group then. Does anybody have any opinion on whether this is a 0 0.2 line item or not? I think this is a 1.0 line item that we need to go and uh, figure out on the 0 0.2. I don't think it's blocking. Okay. What do other people think? 
I agree, not non blocking. Okay. In that case, uh, Klaus, would you be okay with me removing the 0 0.2 label, but, but definitely resolve it for 1.0? Yeah, it's fine. Okay. Any objection then to doing that? Okay, so we'll, we'll do that then. Okay, um, okay, let's see if we can at least quickly talk about this next one. Thank you guys. Hey, Doug, can I squeeze in a quick comment and a quick question? Sure, of course. Okay, first off, I'm not gonna submit that PR for a, a proposed version change. Uh, sorry about that. I, I think right now we just kind of stabilize this thing and focus on you know, reaching that stability so we could focus on building the ecosystem around it, the tools, the SDKs that make it accessible and usable uh, so that developers can put their hands on it and start building it into their applications and we can get that real world feedback that helps drive the specification forward. So I, I don't want to introduce anything else that's going to that's going to cause kind of shocking, jarring changes at this time. So I'm going to withdraw my uh, suggestion or to consider that proposal. Um, and then additionally, one other question for for everyone, uh, would love a great idea for this. We have done a lot of work to transform popular AWS events to cloud events format uh, for an experimental um, thing we're doing in our, our new version of the serverless framework. Um, and we've written these manually just in JavaScript, uh, but it'd be, it would be great to figure out a way where we can basically create transformation mappings store it in some format that's language agnostic that all the SDKs could 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 basically optionally load and do transformations based on based on those mappings and I, I think I, I asked this of, uh, if anyone in the group had suggestions for how we could do that and what we could use for that a little while ago I just want to ask it one more time just to hear if there are any other new suggestions for that Anybody have any comments on that one? No suggestion, but I think it's a great idea. Agreed. Yeah, right now we're, we're looking at uh, velocity templates, which is heavily used by AWS API Gateway uh, for, for transformations. Um, okay, but if anyone has any other thoughts, uh, or ideas, uh, please let me know. I think if we, given all the great people who are in this group, all the resources we have together, if we could start collaborating, if we could figure out how to start mapping out these transformations for very popular events in the ecosystem um, and put them in this language agnostic format, which a whole bunch of tools could optionally load um, as they deem necessary, I think we can make a lot of, a lot of progress getting people onto cloud events uh, pretty quickly. Yeah, are, are there examples that you could uh, share with us that would illustrate how you're transforming between uh, AWS and JavaScript today? Oh, it's it's pretty raw. It's just you know we're we've just written code that looks you know that basically understands the the existing AWS formats and um, transforms them into cloud events formats. There's really nothing well, special going on there. Are are there any that are trickier than others or is it just a pretty rote uh, transformation? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I'm, I didn't write that code and I wasn't, uh, I was the one who did that. So I'm not, I can't answer that. Uh, but from my experience, a lot of those AWS event formats are uh, consistent and they're not changing. Um, so it's, it, sh it should be relatively easy, but again, I didn't, I didn't dig into that. So I, I don't, can't give an informed answer here. I think, I think it's a great idea because it helps us accelerate our understanding as to, to how, you know, we shape cloud events going forwards. It'll also accelerate adoption, you know, people building tooling around this as well. So yeah, great idea. All right. Any other comments or questions for Austin? Yeah, if you, if you have any suggestions, if you think of anything or see anything around the ecosystem, uh, just ping me on Slack. Um, but yeah, I think that would be a great way to, to add some fuel to this fire. All right, cool. Thank you. Thank you, Austin. All right, um, next. So this, this person, I, Lenny, I believe his name, is not on the call. Um, 
he's basically wondering how we send multiple events in HTTP binding. Now, I believe Clemens, you may have made a comment in a previous issue or pull request, I think, basically saying that we're gonna let it fall on the HTTP transport to decide how to do that. And it's outside the scope of us. I believe that's what you yeah. said. So the binary, so the binary mode can't do that because we're mapping that to HTTP headers, and so therefore there's no um, uh, independent way of doing that. Um, that said, um, for the structured mode, uh, where it's all in the payload, we could do that. Um, and factually, in our Azure Event Grid with the current proprietary format that we have, we are doing that. Um, so effectively, the, the, we deliver. We currently deliver JSON only um, in in our product, and so we have an outer array, which means we can do. So that's our standard format. Is an, a standard encoding is an outer array in the JSON, and then we can go and basically send one event, or we can ex, send X events, um, and that doesn't make a difference. Um, if you want to, so batching is something we can go and add, but that complex that makes things more complex. Um, so. Um, that then, you know, puts up the question, if we want to go and add batching, which is not terrible, um, then the, the mapping to the header thing becomes a little bit harder. Um, and then the question there is, um, you know, how, how, many, how many complexities do we need? So uh, basically, I would, from, from, from a complexity perspective, I would say either we do batching uh, or we throw away the binary mode. So what other people think? Yeah, I agree with everything that Clemens just said. We're having the same issue. We're also putting an array at the top so we can actually batch multiple messages into the same thing, but we're also only doing JSON in the structure format, not the binary thing. So I don't see much use for binary in my use case at this. Can we do something with multi-part uh, responses? Oh. Multi-part is super hard. I mean, it's a, it's a, yes, people do it, but it's, uh, you need to have a library to go and do the multi-part thing because you need to go and parse out the, the boundaries and multi-part is, uh, is terrible in, in, in my view. The, the extreme example of wanting to support something like this would be an open connection that streams out individual events and like a continuous stream, like a Twitter feed or something like that, right? Yeah, but you can you can do that with uh, with uh, uh, protocols that support that. Like you you can do that with MQP, you can arguably do that with NATs, and you can do that with MQTT as well. Like HTTP, HTTP is a terrible asynchronous for, uh, asynchronous protocol. That's just that's just the the issue with that one. Potentially, there's also JSONP. Oh, yes. Yeah, but that's kind of a bit of a hack that existed before people came up with things like. Web sockets and uh, um, uh, you know the HTTP two back channel. So let me ask this question since we're running a little low on time here. Um, let's say we decide to do some sort of batching thing. Obviously, well, let me turn this around. If we decide not to do batching, then obviously no change to the specs are needed. But if we decide to do some sort of batching thing, <clears throat> do you guys think that is strictly additive to what we have now, or do you think that's going to potentially fundamentally change what we have? Because if it's not going to fundamentally change what we have, then I'm thinking maybe this isn't a version 0.2 item. A 1.0 item, yes, but maybe not a 0.2 because it's additive. But I want to know what you guys thought. I think batching is a substantial addition and batching changes the way how we think about um, you know, mapping the, uh, um, the events to the uh, um, infrastructure. Um, and because, because if you now carry multiple events in the payload, then you're effectively hiding um, the details of the, those events to the, to the intermediaries. You, see the media, you can't assume that intermediaries can go, open, can go and crack open a, 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 a bag of events. Um, so I'm, and, and batching is useful for HTTP because of its request response nature. Um, it's less useful for protocols that are effectively de uh, delivering um, events in sequence. So I don't think it's, I actually don't think it's critical for 0 0.2, but it's something that we need to go and, and, and look at, but that discussion might be a little bit longer. 
Okay. Um, this is an open question that Knative has uh, around, you know, an event processor takes an event and then returns back in the same HTTP response, multiple yes. events. And we're going to have to wrap it in an array like Clemens was talking about. Yeah. So, so I'm leaning, I'm really kind of from, I've been thinking about this for a while because I, um, you know, making the binary part of the story was something that I did based on feedback that was uh, given early. Um, and I think there might be a middle path here where we pre will preserve some aspects of the binary, which means uh, you know, promotion of properties into headers so that, that middleware could see it. Um, but um, also introduce batching, but I don't have a clear picture of that just yet that I'm certainly not in two minutes. So we ha should go in and have that debate um, um, in one of the next calls. But okay. I, I don't think it holds, I don't think it holds up 0 0.2. It's something that we have to go and deal with, but not, not it's, I don't think it's urgent. Okay. Well, since we only have one minute left, I'm not going to force a decision about whether it's 0 0.2. Let, let's everybody think about it. And on next week's call, we'll, we'll decide whether we want it for 0 0.2 or not. Um, but in the last 30 seconds, there is one other issue that's tagged with 0 0.2. It's another transport. Please take a look at this one when you get a chance so we can decide whether we want to pursue that or not. I don't think we necessarily have to have the transport in place for 0 0.2, but I think we, per our, mode, per our roadmap, we have to decide whether we want to put it in 0 point, or, sorry, for 0 0.2, we have to decide if we want to do it or not. We don't have to necessarily do it for 0 0.2, but we just need to decide if we're gonna do it. So look at that when you get a chance. When you get a chance. So, um, so this one, just, just, just yeah. one sentence on that. Um, for this one, the HTTP binding that we have would apply, but we need to have a, a different uh, spec uh, like the webhook spec that defines how that's actually happening over that particular channel, but it's just an HTTP message. All right. Okay. All right. And so with that, 30 seconds, I just want to do the roll call quick to make sure I get people on there. Scott, I heard you. Erica, are you still there? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, excellent, thank you, hold on. Um, Ling Lee, are you there? Ying Lee? What about Victor? Yeah, he is me. Okay, Luciano? Luciano, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Excellent, okay. Uh, Christine? Uh, me too, here. Okay, Fabio? I'm here. Excellent. Victor um, Matos is here. Oh. Yep, I got you, Victor. Okay, thank you. Adriano? Adriano Gomez? What about yes. Thiago? Oh, I got you, Adriano. Okay, what about Thiago? I'm here. Okay, and Steve, are you there? Yes, and you okay. got uh, Ying Li instead of Victor first. Yeah. Oh, wait, uh, I'm sorry, is, is Ying Li on the call? No. Well, who is AW? There was an AW in the attendee list. Or employee, <laughs> kind of funny name. Okay, is there anybody on the roll call that I missed? All right, cool. Thank you guys very much. And I apologize for running over one minute, but this was a good call. We made a lot of really good decisions today. So thank you guys very much. And we'll talk next week. And uh, I've, Clemens, I just remembered, Kathy said she wasn't gonna be here today, so that's why she's not on the call. Um, actually, Clemens dropped. So anyway, uh, we were not going to have the phone call after this one to, to discuss um, the slides for Shanghai, if you guys were thinking about doing that, since Kathy's not going to be here and Clement is gone too. So the call will end here. We're not going to have the follow-on call. All right. Thanks, guys. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Bye, guys. Bye-bye.